not were fulfilled, he resolutely determined to journey to Jerusalem, and he sent his messengers ahead of him. On the way, they entered a Samaritan village to prepare for his reception there, but they would not welcome him because the destination of his journey was Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and consume them? Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they journeyed to another village. As they were proceeding on their journey, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus answered him, Foxes have dens, and birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to rest his head. And to another he said, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. But he answered him, Let the dead bury their dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me say farewell to my family at home. To him Jesus said, No one who sets a hand to the plow and looks to what was left behind is fit for the kingdom of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. As most of you know, my dad is pretty much in full blown Alzheimer's, so he's in a lockdown facility, but he still has his humor and it will be lucid at times. So my brother was visiting him a couple weeks ago. And uh, Dad's always saying, I'm going to heaven, we're going to heaven. And my brother looked at him and he said, today? <laughs> he said, no, <"Nope>, Thursday. <laughs> he's still got his humor. <laughs> I've heard a story about a pastor in the Chicago area. Had a true story. And at his grade school, Catholic grade school, he'd pick out about four or five or six of the eighth grade boys and say, you're going to Quigley next year. You're going to Quigley. You're going to Quigley. And not to the seminary. So they didn't have to stay in it. They just went off the seminary. Uh, story goes that the, one of the persons that uh, was, uh, was relating the story that the priest had just celebrated his 50th year of priesthood. He would get a, a sense that people were called the priesthood and said, you're going to go to the seminary. And that's, that's kind of how God works if we let him. It's not like a negotiation. He just says, this is what I want you to do. Do it. Follow me. And in the, the first reading, Elisha uh, being called to be a prophet, he had 12 oxen. That's amazing. To have one, you were a wealthy man. He had 12. So that indicates the cost of following God. He, he was uh, called, called to follow God as a prophet, so he had to leave those oxen behind him and uh, in, in our following of God. And what does that following God bring us into, which what I want to point to and talk about is freedom. What is true freedom? St. Paul says to Galatians, brothers and sisters, for freedom Christ has set us free. So stand firm and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. So freedom, Christ has set us free. In our world, what freedom means is a lot of people want freedom from outside constraints. We want freedom from life. The church is not going to tell me what to do. And nobody else is going to tell me what to do that. And tradition, no, not tradition. That won't tell me what to do. I will determine that myself. I will be in self-determination of how I'm going to live. But uh, that's a, a probably maybe one, one of the number one myths in our world that the uh, world proposes is that in freedom, I will decide what that is. But as in biblical sense of freedom, God's already decided that. God is free. Free to love and to be loved. And he's perfectly free. There's no sin, no constraint. And freedom in the biblical sense means to know and to do God's will. Or we can say it, to do the good. Where does our unfreedom uh, happen? Uh, it happens when... Uh, like we, we cling to uh, things when we, we grab on and uh, we hold on to that and it's anything but freedom. Uh, we attach ourselves to something. So I just want to give us a couple of examples where unfreedom can happen 
and then uh, how God works with us in that to, to bring us from that unfreedom or not experiencing freedom. So these attachments. The first one I'll share with you is a um, young man, knowing my experience, ready to get married, and so we are talking about that. He was talking about his relationship with his dad, and his dad just wasn't present growing up. His dad was working, 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 so he wasn't present, he wasn't a good dad. And this young man, he was very painful for him because the relationship that he wanted in his life out of it, every other relationship save God, is the relationship with his dad. So he knew that this was something very much going on in his life and as he approaches his wedding day, he, uh, he shared with me that, you know, he dealt with that, that first that anger, but mostly that pain. And he's come into a, a forgiving relationship and a much better relationship with his dad. And so kind of framing this in terms of um, his attachment, he had attachment to hatred and unforgiveness. And he had to let go of that if he wanted to experience true freedom in Christ. So he was attached to that anger and unforgiveness. And I just like to propose a little three-step process that we can do for that. When you think about what you might be attached to that's not giving you freedom in your life. So he had to name it. He had to confess it. And then he had to redirect it. By the director of all life, Christ. So he had to name his unforgiveness and his uh, you know, resentment, his bitterness, his hatred. He had to confess that to a priest and to other people, and then he had to redirect that. Now here's what the evil one likes to do. He likes to isolate. And so that we won't name and confess and redirect. True or false, you can be a good Catholic in isolation. And that's why we have this. That's why I'm encouraging us always to enter in more with each other. Because it's false that we think we can just Keep our keep quiet and not name and confess things to the priest and to one another, so that we can redirect in God's line. Another story: high school senior, uh, very very uh, graduating from high school, very very protected, doesn't trust, so is attached to that sin of mistrust, doesn't trust, doesn't have friends build up a big wall around her. And she's graduated from high school but doesn't have friends. She's just kind of at home. Kind of the way her mother was with her own life. Really good friends with her mother but then that's about it. And so there was this attachment to not trusting. Not trusting in God. Not trusting in other human beings. Because you can get hurt, right? So why would you want to trust other human beings? It's something that's very real and can occur among us. So our passion was to, and is, to not trusting, not opening her life to something greater than herself. Basically, she's her own person that she trusts, and that we know how feeble and mortal that is. So she's in the middle of that right now, so it's time for her to go off to college, right? So she gets together with mom and dad, I can't, it's just too much. Because she has no sense of self, and... No, no, uh, no trust in, in anything, no growth, very limited socially because she's never reached out and mixed it up and entered into the chaos of the relationship and the vulnerability of the relationship. So she is attached to mistrust and not trusting, not trusting God and other people. So what she's going to need to do is name that, confess that, and then redirect. She's going to need to name that distrust, confess that, and then redirect God calls us to relationship, to community. And then that, that's how freedom happens. Freedom can never happen in isolation. It happens in trusting God. That as we trust God, that His love will be enough for us and that we can love and be loved and take the chances in our relationship with one another. So we, we know and we read from St. Paul, brothers and sisters, for freedom, Christ has set us free. He 
wants us to be free, but we're not free if we have an attachment. 